What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Today we're here with Dr. Christina Madison. Now, you know, she's here to talk to us today about, you know, her profession. Definitely, you know, it's pharmacy. She's, she's a specialist. She's, you know, very, very experienced. Um, many, many accolades, you know, in her time. She'll share, you know, her accolades. But the reason why I wanted to bring her on is that one, we haven't had a, a, a person come on that, you know, specialize, you know, in pharmacy. And I, like I, I stated many times before, we need more people in the community is going to do things that I say is nation building, not more rappers, you know, athletes or, or strippers. Sorry, we just don't need that. It's too oversaturated. So, Dr. Christina, thank you for joining us on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your time today, Philip. All right, Dr. Christina, let's tell people a little bit about yourself. You know, how did you, you know, want to get involved in pharmacy? Yeah, excellent question. So, uh, you know, when I think about the profession of pharmacy and just letting you guys know, October is actually American Pharmacist Month. So we are celebrating all things pharmacy in the month of October uh, and just the, you know, the sheer, uh, you know, expansiveness of all of our abilities to have different disciplines and to be able to impact our community. So I decided to go into pharmacy uh, after uh, being an undergrad and there was a new pharmacy school that was opening in my area and I got accepted right away. I actually got accepted a year earlier than if I had chosen to go to either graduate school or to medical school. And so I really got a jump start on my career path. So I've actually been a pharmacist uh, for 16 years as of this year. And I have been um, teaching as an associate professor of pharmacy practice. And um, my area of expertise is in public health and specifically in infectious communicable diseases which, as I'm sure you were probably aware of, um, has been in high demand during this pandemic, which has been um, pretty amazing that all of my years in public health have, have been able to help me to give accurate and factual information to the public and to be um, what I would like to consider comforting um, during you know, these uncertain times and, and really to, to be a very clear voice um, for those who, who are seeking that right now so, so growing up um as as a, a little girl you know what, what you know what kind of community you, you grew up in so i'm um from las vegas nevada i'm actually a nevada native but i grew up um in las vegas proper uh so we uh you know obviously had the strip and all of that entertainment stuff we always had family coming in from um from back east to come and hang out with us and i think a lot of people thought oh you know you must live on the strip or you know are there are there slot machines in your schools and uh, you know, all of the uh, the typical stereotypes, but um, really, you know, what it comes down to at Las Vegas is really just a small town. Um, we have some big entertainment, but for the most part, we're very community minded. Um, you know, I volunteered um, as a candy striper um, at our local hospital, um, very much about community engagement. I'm also on the board of a nonprofit here in town that helps women that have been victims of sex trafficking. So, you know, we are definitely um, all about out helping each other and and uh, you know we just had our October one um, anniversary of the shooting here and you know again it's just kind of re-emphasize that you know love of community and partnership and really wanting to help others in their time of need so that's how I grew up I did all of my um, schooling here um, I left and did a, a year residency in Albuquerque New Mexico so I did a pharmacy practice residency and then I moved back to Las Vegas and um, started my career path in public health and um, as a faculty member and an instructor well, let me ask you a question. You know, th there's a big gap in, in healthcare period uh, with, you know, African Americans. Why is it that, that you believe that's happening? And is it the same in, in the area of pharmacy? Yeah, so I think um, first and foremost, representation matters, right? So I always say this, especially with the patient population that I work with, because we do have um, what I would consider vulnerable populations that um, I work with. And so I think when you have someone that looks and sounds like you, you are ultimately more likely to take their recommendations and to adhere to your healthcare plan. And so the fact that we don't have as much representation, especially when we think about, you know, um, in 
the medical field, specifically in, you know, black doctors, but also pharmacists as well. We actually do have quite a few um, pharmacists of color um, and now women um, are going into pharmacy, but we still um, have a long way to go. And so I would say, you know, ultimately, I think it's just uh, going into the community early on. So even in like, say, elementary school, or maybe even early high school and talking about these career paths, because I think um, sometimes it's just due to lack of knowledge and not knowing that these career paths are open, and not understanding sort of what the requirements are, and, and not realizing that maybe there's not as many steps as people may think, um, in order to obtain your doctorate, and to um, really have a very meaningful career. Um, I've, like I said, you know, part of the reason why I ended up in pharmacy was because, you know, I got accepted to the school early. I was able to kind of jumpstart my professional career. I graduated from pharmacy school at 24. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize that that's even an option to them. So I think we need to do a better job of educating, um, you know, our communities about these career paths and, and to do more direct mentorship to really help foster that development in order to see more people that look like us that are taking care of us so that we can really um, combat some of these health disparities um, um, that have been entrenched in our healthcare system due to discrimination. So, you know, in our community, sometimes we, we, we have to have certain numbers, you know, thrown at us because a lot of times we just don't even know what those career paths could even make financially. So yes. on entry level, coming out of college, you know, got your degree, let's say if you go work at a, uh, Walgreens, CVS, you know, uh, where you are, they used to be right aid, but now it's Walgreens, I guess now. Um, <laughs> what, what, what would a person make now in 2020 coming out of school for somebody that can be listening and say, that sounds interesting? Yeah. So um, depending on what state you work in, obviously, and then, you know, your level of, uh, of you know, when you graduated, but like a, a grad now um, could, you know, it's a six figure salary, depending on how many hours you work. Um, but, you know, that that salary could be anywhere from, you know, 50 to $60 an hour, depending on whether or not you're working in a community pharmacy setting versus in a hospital setting. So, you know, it definitely is um, a uh, you know, from a financial standpoint, it's it's definitely a, a very um, a good job. Uh, you know, you do have to pay off your student loans if you aren't able to, you know, to pay for your schooling up front. But there is uh, quite a bit of earning potential there uh, if you are looking to go into the profession of pharmacy. Okay, so you say about fifty to sixty dollars an hour, and 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 once you get a little, you know, I say some experience, you know, down the line. Um, that can even probably even grow to maybe about a hundred dollars an hour, am I right? So it depends on where you work, but mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you're working in an area where you can get paid either time and a half or overtime, or maybe there's you know, you're doing a, a job that's very specialized, you may get more. Um, it really just depends on how you decide to specialize. Okay, so let's talk about you know, and I, I know you've been you know, on a lot of you know, national media platforms talking about this. Let's talk about COVID-19. Um, you know, you know, it's definitely has affected a lot of people, you know, definitely more, what, 210,000 people um, have, you know, died from COVID-19. And um, recently we've seen even uh, Donald Trump was diagnosed with COVID-19, but, but we have a big problem and maybe you can address this problem. Um, the mask wearing is this big old deal and I don't understand why this, this has been so politicized because this this site like is wrong to politicize this. Yes. But what you know, just on on your you know expertise, mm -hmm. um, with a mask wearing masks, would that actually save lives, or people are just saying like you know, well, it, it's no big deal. I mean, what is your your take on that? Hundred percent wearing a mask saves lives. <laughs> it's not even debatable. It's literally the simplest and easiest thing that you can do to protect yourself and those around you. Um, I always say, you know, um, you know, keep your respiratory droplets to yourself. And I think about, I think about wearing a mask, um, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Um, you want to think about your mask like you think about wearing your underwear, right? You would never leave your house without it on, hopefully. Um, you wouldn't leave the house if it wasn't clean. 
right? You wouldn't let someone else use it, right? And you would make sure that it fit well. <laughs> so when you think of it in that regard, uh, you know, everyone should be wearing one. It is not, it's not politicized. And unfortunately, I think what ended up happening is that at the very, very beginning of the pandemic, um, we should have been honest with the American people and told them that we weren't sure how this um, infection was spread and that we weren't positive that masks could help prevent the spread of the infection, as well as the fact that we didn't realize that over almost 50% of people are asymptomatic spreaders. And so that's really where this is coming from. It's, it's to protect yourself, but it's also really to protect those around you. Because if you are asymptomatic and you're not wearing a mask, you could continuously spread this infection to those around you. So if everyone wears a mask, then we basically put a handle on it, right? So if you're an a uh, potentially asymptomatic spreader, you have a mask on and you're keeping your respiratory droplets to yourself. And now we're seeing that there's even some data coming out saying that um, people who are wearing uh, just a you know a consumer face covering that meets that WHO or World Health Organization recommendation of having at least three layers, that that's even protective for the wearer as well as um, for those around the person um, that they could potentially spread their infectious uh, respiratory droplets to. So 100% mask save lives, mask up, do what you got to do, make sure it fits well, make sure you can breathe through it. Not all masks are the same. They come in different sizes and different colors. They can match it to your outfit. Um, let's just get it done, people. This is what we need to do to be able to recover from uh, from this and, you know, from this pandemic, not, not just financially, but also making sure that we don't lose more people to this potentially deadly infection. So do you believe that the people that's run around here saying, well, it's my freedom and it's freedom and um, mm -hmm. not to wear a mask in the pandemic. And I went, like I said, I just came back from West Virginia, even some part, one place in Ohio, and they have mass mandates by, by the governor, but no one follows it at all. <laughs> people, you know, you have maybe a few people wearing masks. You mm -hmm. see the people in the business wearing masks. But yeah, they're all gathering with no mask. And I'm just, I, of course, I have my mask on and I'm just shaking my head, Dr. Christina, like, what are these people doing? It's like so here's, <laughs> yeah. So uh, first and foremost, absolutely. There are some individuals who may not be able to wear a mask due to their medical conditions or doing uh, due to being too young. Uh, you know, the recommendation is for age two and up without uh, chronic medical conditions that may put them at risk for having difficulty breathing, right? So I just wanna point that out, that there are some individuals who may not be able to wear a mask safely. However, for the mass majority of the population, wearing a mask is safe, effective, and does not harm your health. For those individuals who feel that it is their personal right not to wear a mask, that is fine. You cannot wear a mask in your own home or outside of the public space. If you are choosing to go out in public, you are now potentially endangering others. Please do not do that. Okay. Unfortunately, you are right. You know, there are, you know, these people who are working hourly wage jobs in restaurants and, you know, establishments. And, you know, they're not paid enough to be the mask police. Um, unfortunately, we do need to, you know, be able to keep people safe. And so it's kind of on us as our personal responsibility to say, you know, you know, can you can you please wear a mask? Or, you know, if you choose not to wear a mask, you know, please don't come into my establishment. You know, it's just, I think people just need to take responsibility. And I'm hoping, um, you know, with this recent um, uptick in the number of cases and showing, you know, when you don't socially distance and when you don't wear a mask, this is how you get the virus, that people will be more mindful of that. So, you know, all we can do is hope, all we can do is make things easier for them. You know, maybe it's the fact that they were, you know, using a mask that wasn't comfortable, wasn't breathable, you know, uh, ultimately, you know, not all masks are the same. So, you know, maybe if they were having a mask that felt 
more comfortable to them, maybe they'd be more likely to wear it. And so again, I just encourage people to, you know, try different ones, uh, make sure it meets that WHO standard of at least having, uh, you know, two, if not three layers is recommended in order to really keep yourself and others safe. And, you know, try it out, wear it, see if it, if it's comfortable for you, if it fits well, it needs to cover both your nose and your mouth. You know, this is, this is super, super important. Now, have you did any studies on why the African continent and even the Caribbean has done better with coronavirus than America? Because on the African continent, out of what 1.6 billion people, they only had 34,000 deaths out of 54,000 countries. 54, I'm sorry, countries. And uh, in different places in the Caribbean, um, some places they had no deaths at all of uh, COVID-19. So, why mm -hmm. is it that the mm -hmm. African continent has done so much better? and the Caribbean so much better than America. Have you studied any of that? So that's an excellent question. As far as specific studies looking at that, um, I'm not familiar with anything that's been published um, recently. However, I will tell you that there are a few theories that are out there of why we think that um, they have experienced fewer deaths. So there's a couple of things that we think may be contributing to the fact that they have been able to really have a um, a good handle on containing the virus. Um, the first thing is that um, when the initial pandemic started, they shut down their entire country. So, um, you know, no one was able to leave. They did full quarantine and had very few businesses open, only really that um, in order to help people if they needed medical attention. So completely shutting down, you know, their countries. Um, really, I think, um, set the stage to lower um, the infection rate down to something that was manageable. The other thing, too, is that they implemented, um, you know, a national testing strategy. Um, so everyone knew where they could get a test. Everyone was being tested. Um, uh, if you look at the numbers of people who have tested in those countries, large numbers of the, of the population have been tested. The other thing, too, is that, um, you know, uh, outdoor space. So they tend to use more outdoor space. Um, you don't see a lot of like commercial air conditioning. Um, so the ventilation is um, usually better. Um, you know, all of those things that we know contribute to COVID transmission, you know, being in indoor spaces, not having proper ventilation, um, you know, uh, not implementing, uh, you know, contact tracing and uh, regular uh, testing strategies, as well as getting that initial infection rate down to a more manageable level so that if you do see cases, um, you're able to manage them more quickly versus in the case of the United States, um, we um, never really were able to get our, our infection rate down to a, a low baseline so that when we started to reopen the country again, you started seeing these outbreaks and it was much more difficult to manage. Okay, so and the last thing I definitely want to ask you is about the drugs that President Trump w was having, and should we be using the same drugs? And I'm looking at them. What they gave him uh, was uh, uh, the remdesivir. Um, yes. They gave him that. Um, they gave him the, the dexamethasone, mm -hmm. that steroid, and that uh, mm -hmm. those antibodies from Regeneron. Is what is it? Monoclonal? Uh, if I'm saying it just right, antibodies. Mm -hmm. Um, polyclonal antibodies <laughs> right so so do, and do you believe we should be given the same thing and that's what they gave him so that's an excellent question i will tell you um when we look at sort of how the medications have been employed um first and foremost there is no fda approved medication right now for covid um of the medications that you've listed and that have been given um, for the management of the president's care. Um, two of them have what we call emergency use authorization, um, which is, um, you know, not quite um, FDA approved, but considering the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic, we need to collect more data in order to, to determine uh, whether or not the medications are effective. So with the remdesivir, we do have good information, um, which is how it got its emergency use authorization, that it did decrease um, number of days in the hospital. Um, and then the dexamethasone, when it is given um, at a particular time in someone's um, disease course, um, does improve survival. So both of those things together um, have been used as part of a protocol with um, patients who've had 
um, COVID-19 in the past. And then as far as the antibodies go, um, that is what we call compassionate use. And so that is a little bit more experimental. Um, those antibodies have been used only in about 250 patients at this point and have not been um, something that's been widely used. They're still collecting data to see if um, those antibodies are helpful to get the viral load down um, initially when somebody is sick, um, either because they've had a very large amount of virus that they've been exposed to, or if they're high risk for having complications associated with um, COVID-19. So um, all of these things together, what I would say is remdesivir and dexamethasone are part of COVID-19 protocols and is something that someone would get if they had um, the indicators to receive that particular regimen. We do usually reserve that to patients who have um, a more progressed um, and a more serious course of COVID-19 pneumonia. Um, as far as the polyclonal antibody cocktail, that is still um, kind of being studied right now. So I would say as far as that being offered to the general public, we would need to wait until we got more data to see its actual efficacy, safety, and benefit um, in this particular patient population. Like I said, high risk and those who had uh, a lot of virus that they were exposed to, um, that they're concerned about having a more prolonged or complicated course associated with the infection. Yeah, because they also said that on top of that, they gave him a zinc, Pepsi, aspirin, vitamin D, and melatonin on top of that. Um, yes. Um, so these were all things that um, had been used in cocktails in the past. Um, for individuals, that's actually um, a, a regimen that they were using um, in New York City and were being tested um, to see if that would be something that would be helpful for patients there in the beginning of their course. Again, to decrease that viral load and to try to stop um, something called a cytokine storm, which is where the um, body's immune system kind of is overwhelmed and end up causing more damage, um, especially to things like the kidneys and the heart and the lungs. Okay, so if, if they're using all this for, for President Trump, you said some of this is, isn't approved yet. Now, we talk about African Americans with, with COVID. And I understand a lot of the pre-existing conditions that we deal with. I mean, you know, them. We, we both we talk about that here all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a firm believer and maybe you can confirm this. It, I believe it's just between not getting enough sun because we're sun people and mm -hmm. not eating, you know, the right foods and loaded full of salt, chemicals, food dyes, et cetera, which gives us the pre-existing conditions um, that make COVID, you know, real deadly. Um, Outside of that, and we look at our, like, say, brothers and sisters in Africa, Caribbean, you know, mm -hmm. so what, what is it about us? Because every time in America, we always more susceptible to something in health than everybody else. I mean, what, what, what is that? So I think it's a couple of things. Um, ultimately, yes, this particular infection does um, disproportionately impact those who have underlying medical conditions, which we know are more um, common in, um, you know, in uh, people of color, but really what it comes down to is access to care and access to quality care. So we've seen, you know, many stories um, that have been reported about people of color seeking medical attention and saying that they had symptoms or saying that they were at risk and were denied care or maybe got care too late. And that potentially could have um, contributed to their untimely um, deaths. And so I think it really comes down to access of care and access to quality care. And really that comes back to what I said earlier, which is representation matters. And so when we are, you know, not being treated by other, you know, physicians and having more people in, um, you know, in the healthcare field that look and sound like us, we unfortunately have those, you know, um, un, you know, you know, implicit and sometimes um, unimplicit biases within our healthcare system that um, unfortunately um, cause us to not get good um, healthcare. And so I think all of those things combined have really uh, come to light during this pandemic. 
um, and it has, um, you know, really unfortunately disproportionately impacted our, our individuals of color. So not having the resources, not being able to access quality care, um, in some instances not having insurance, um, all of those things combined have really unfortunately um, caused more black and brown individuals to um, pass away from this infection, as well as our indigenous brothers and sisters. All right, Dr. Christina, um, you know, now we had discussed that. And like I said, if you can tell people, you know, how, you know, like I said, maybe those that could be interested in your program or or because I know you do coaching as well, correct? Oh, yeah. So I have a, yes. Um, so I have a consulting business called the Public Health Pharmacist, and I do do um, coaching, um, professional coaching for other pharmacists or other healthcare professionals that are interested in the area of public health. Okay. Can you tell people how to get to that? Because they say, okay, man, I, I'm interested in, in pharmacy and I like to maybe ask some questions or get some coaching. Absolutely. You can find me at the Public Health Pharmacist on all of your favorite social media channels. Um, that's LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, um, and Facebook. Or you can um, just find me on my website, which is thepublichealthpharmacist.com. Um, and then one more thing before we leave, I just wanted to show you guys um, my mask of choice. So this is my Boomer Naturals 30-day, um, 30 30-use 30 face mask. I definitely want to make sure everyone knows. Um, this is the one that I use for myself and my family. It uh, has nano silver technology, three layers of protection. It's comfortable, it's cozy, and it comes in lots of different um, styles and colors and sizes. So please, please, please wear a mask and wash your hands. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we definitely appreciate Dr. Christina for joining us today and definitely, you know, get, get your mask, wear your mask. Don't don't be out here, you know, listening to certain individuals taking off their masks and they actually have an open COVID infection, but we're not going to mention their names. Um, but Dr. Christina, definitely, you know, we appreciate you joining us today and giving us, you know, some great information about the career, you know, in pharmacy and, and definitely with COVID. Absolutely. Thank you so much again, Philip, for your time. And I hope that your um, your viewers um, got something out of this today and really stay healthy and stay well and all the best to you.